Good morning and welcome to this pre-recorded meeting from Calvary Church here in Brighton on the south coast of England. And uh, this morning uh, I'm introducing it. My name is Philip Wells. I work for the church as pastor elder and the speaker is going to be Julian Ribera, our very good friend, and we're very grateful for him for speaking uh, to us this morning, and I'll, I'll be handing over to him in due course. So a very warm welcome to you visiting, and a very warm welcome, as I say, to our special guest speaker. The plan of what's happening is up on the screen behind my head, so I've done the welcome and introduction, and in a moment we're going to sing a psalm. The psalm is, if you have the book, uh, praise book, it's 98A, but the words will come up on the screen and you'll be able to sing along to it. It's the one that says, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things, for his right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love, his faithfulness, to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord. So it's a very exuberant song of praise. And uh, perhaps we need a little bit of stirring up in these days at this time to remember that God is always great and greatly to be praised. So let's come before him, sing to God new songs of worship, uh, Psalm 98. In a moment we'll come and pray, but before we do that, let's hear what God says to us before we come to speak to him, and let's hear what he says to us through his own son, the Lord Jesus, our Saviour. And I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12, and this is the remarkable sort of upside-down blessing that Jesus confers on his followers. So Matthew chapter 5 verse 1 says, When he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Because that's what teachers did, they sat down to teach. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You, says Jesus, are the salt of the earth. And we thank the Lord for his wonderful word. And now we're going to turn to him in prayer. We come, O Lord, to worship you, to remember that you are great and greatly to be praised. We lift up our hearts to you. We shout to the Lord, as it were, because you are glorious. We want to sing to you new songs of worship. We want to praise you for your faithfulness, your love. We want to praise you for your mercy. We want to praise you for your righteousness. We want to praise you for your holiness. We want to praise you in your glory. We think of you high above this world that you have made and uh, we think you have made it, it belongs to you with all its wonder and complexity and even in all its rebellion. So we come in worship and we come to confess our sins and we ask that you will change us as we turn to you from our sin, as we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to be, be, be people who learn Christ who put off sin and put on Christ. So we pray, Lord, that we'd be able to put off the ingratitude and the grumbles that so often are on our lips and in our minds. Help us to be grateful. Help us to have eyes to see your generosity and goodness towards us. Help us to be God-centred and Christ-centred. Forgive us that we are so often self-centred just thinking of our, how it affects us instead of how things matter to you. Please take away our pride, O Lord, uh, that within us which makes us think that we're the centre of the universe uh, and we're great when actually, Lord, we're wretched sinners who are only anything because you've shown grace to us. Help us to learn the humility of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in all these ways and in many more, Cause us to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Cause us to cleave to him in faith and love and grant us to put on Christ and all his ways in our hearts and lives and have the blessing that we just heard him pronounce. We also pray for the advance of his kingdom and we pray that in our land and across the world many people will come to know and love Jesus Christ and turn from their sins to him. We particularly think of our city in its need, like Nineveh, where there were hundreds of thousands of people who didn't know their right hand from their left. And surely you, as you had compassion on that great city of old, you have compassion on our city here. Please bless every gospel church, whether it is large or small. But our hearts are particularly wrapped up with the fortunes of the smaller churches like the dear people at Park Hill Evangelical Church, the folk at e Ebenezer Reformed Baptist Church, uh, the people at New Life Moolscombe, uh, the impending Grace Church plant and our own fellowship here at Calvary. Be pleased Lord to send labourers into the harvest, be pleased to fill your people with your Holy Spirit. Be pleased to use us to bring glory to Jesus Christ and make us clear and confident and bold 
to speak about him at every right opportunity. So may his kingdom come and we pray in his name. Amen. The next song we're going to have is 566, for those of you who have a book. Be still for the presence of the Lord is moving in this place. It's actually, well, we're not in the same place, are we? But this does remind us that there is something very special about being in the presence of God. And uh, this is the song that Ruth sang for Colleen's funeral, and uh, very beautifully too, if I might say so. So let's be in God's presence as we sing this song, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord is moving in this place. Be still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is He. Now for our second reading, again in Matthew's Gospel, I'm going to read the passage that Julian is going to speak about, and it's in chapter 7, verses 7 to 12. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 12. It ends up with a, one of these bookends uh, earlier on in his talk, in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus had said, I don't come to abolish the law and the prophets. And here's the other book end of that, where he says, this sums up the law and the prophets. So we'll just catch that in the end of this reading. But here we are in chapter 7, starting at verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. 
for this sums up the law and the prophets. So we thank God for his word and Julian's going to speak on that in just a moment. It is about prayer and I take this opportunity uh, to remind you if you're watching in real time that this afternoon there is a, a prayer meeting. The details have been advertised three o'clock to pray for grace church plant and David Skull's organising that prayer meeting and uh, I think Julian will really be encouraging us to be part of that or that will be one of the actions following from what he's uh, going to speak about concerning prayer. Well uh, I mentioned speaking let's ask the Lord to speak this next song is speak O Lord as we come to you and we do really want the Lord to speak to us so let's sing um, <coughs> Or reference it's 1148 but uh, the words again will come up on the screen speak O Lord brothers and sisters at Calvary Chapel. It's great to be among you, even if it is through video. And um, I bring greetings to you from New Life in Brighton as well. It's a great joy to be able to share with you from God's Word. And we're thinking about a really great subject. We're thinking today about prayer, looking at Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 12. I think we've already had it read, so I'm not going to read it again. Uh, but this is that famous little passage, ask and you will receive, seek you will find, knock the door will be open. Um, it's a great encouragement for us to pray and we need encouragement to pray. And, and before we get into the passage, 
I want to do or question a question. Okay, here's the question that I want to question. The question is this, does prayer work? All right, does prayer work? Now, this is an, imp an important question to question because I think it's a, a really unhelpful question. Ultimately, I do believe prayer works. I've got real conviction prayer works, but I think it's an entirely wrong question to ask in the way that we ask it and think about it most of the time. When we think about the whole idea of prayer working, maybe, maybe it's not that we ask the question, does prayer work? Maybe we tell people prayer works. Maybe we think, oh yeah, prayer works. We have that kind of mentality, and I don't think it's a helpful one. I do think prayer works, but I think even when I say that, I hate even to say that because here's the reason why, right? When we talk about does prayer work, it makes it out like it, it gives the impression and the view that prayer is a bit like a divine, it's like we, we come to a divine slot machine. Prayer is the currency. We put the currency in the slot and out rolls the answer to prayer, the Coca-Cola at the bottom of the divine vending machine. You know, do you know what I mean by that? You know, when we does prayer work? It's like what we saying about prayer, we say that it's some sort of impersonal mechanism. You know, sometimes we can think of, of it a bit like a, a spell, you know? We say a prayer, as long as we say in Jesus' name, like abracadabra, we should get the answer because Jesus said, you can ask for anything in my name and I will do it. It's like, so if I, if, as long as I say in his name, he'll do it, right? And, and we can construe from Jesus' words, that, yeah, this kind of divine slot machine, divine vending machine mentality. And, you know, I think that's all wrong and it causes all sorts of problems. It causes all sorts of problems. It causes problems because we have, we've all experienced praying for things that haven't worked out. And, and not, we're not just talking about one or two things, are we, if we're honest? How many things have you prayed for and you've not had the answer? How many times have you sought something for God or in God and not found? How many times have you knocked on the door? Maybe you've in an endeavour, in mission, prayerfully, and it's not, it just hasn't opened. All of us have had that kind of experience. The whole question about prayer works, listen, right, this is true. In the New York Times, there was a report, 31st of January, 2006. Um, it was a report on a whole load of scientific research that was done on prayer. You may have heard about this, but New York Times reporting on it, this is what they said. This, this was the, the conclusion. Prayers offered by strangers had no, this is 1,800 patients over 10 years, this research was carried out over. Prayers offered by strangers had no effect on the recovery of people who were undergoing heart surgery. A large, heart surgery, a large and long awaited study has found. And patients who knew that they were being prayed for had a higher rate of post-operative complications like abnormal heart rhythms, perhaps because of the expectations the prayers created, the researchers suggested. You know, scientific research even suggests that prayer doesn't work. If we think of it in that kind of way, it doesn't seem to work. Now, Firstly, I don't think we need to be worried about that scientific research, right? Because however carefully it was carried out, it raises, you know, we have to ask the question, don't we? Why would God subject himself to human experimentation to val validate his existence or his power? He's not going to do that. It's like, just because it's an experiment, I imagine God wouldn't do it. But, but the point that I'm making is this, right? It's not healthy to think about does prayer work in the way that we often think. Now, let's get into our little passage here. This passage in Matthew chapter 7 follows Matthew chapter 6. And in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus teaches on prayer. And in Matthew chapter 6, he gives us a couple of 
conditions. He, said, he teaches us in chapter six, the Lord's Prayer. And uh, and basically what he teaches is, is that we shouldn't pray just for show. You know, don't, don't pray to be seen by men, he says. And so the quali- you know, the, the, there's a qualification or a disqualification is praying for our own glory. That would be why we don't see prayers answered. That's one reason that Jesus gives. But, you know, apart from that, you know, the, the, the positive way of putting it is this. Jesus says, pray in my name. Very often, doesn't he? That's what he says. And, you know, if you take all the teachings of Jesus across the Gospels on prayer, it, what it amounts to, all that he says about prayer, is loads and loads and loads of encouragement for us to pray. That's what it amounts to. He wants to give us lots of encouragement to pray. Lots of encouragement, very, very few qualifications. The apostles later, they give a few more qualifications. Like James says, you don't ask, you don't receive because you don't ask. When you do ask, you ask for wrong motives. You may spend what you get and blah, blah, blah. But Jesus gives very few qualifications for prayer. Why is that? Why, why does he give so much encouragement, very few qualifications? Well, could it be that he knows that we need very little reason to not pray? In other words, if he gives too many qualifications, he knows we're just not going to really get started with it. It seems to me that Jesus is more than anything just keen for us to get praying. So he says, doesn't he, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open. Yeah, he's given a bit of teaching, but then he says, let's just do it and see. He he teaches us the Lord's Prayer in chapter six. And then he's saying, get on with it. Get asking, get seeking, get knocking. If you know the Lord's Prayer, you know everything you need to know to get started in prayer. It's not some great mystery. So Jesus tells us, ask, seek, knock. Why does he tell us to ask, seek and knock? Well, he tells us why in verse eight. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Now, I don't know, this is like pretty, um, it's, it's very basic, isn't it? Yeah. Why does he say ask? Why does he give us this invitation, this exhortation? Well, because those who ask receive. Those who seek find. To those who knock, the door will be opened. That's why. That's why. And and notice notice this as well. Don't fail to notice that one small word, everyone. 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 Who asks, receives. This is encouragement, isn't it? This is real encouragement to pray. Jesus is saying, come on, come on, everyone who asks, receives, get asking. And when he says, to the one who knocks, the door will be opened, and to the one who seeks, finds, that is exactly the same as saying everyone who seeks. You know, to the one, whoever that one is. If that's you, you know, you're, you're, we're all in everyone and we're all a one. You, if you seek, you will find. This is what Jesus said. If you knock, the door will be opened. So he gives us great encouragement. Now, as, he get, as we think about that great encouragement, we might think of objections. Excuse me. Maybe you think, well, do you know what? I, I've kind of lost faith for prayer. Maybe you think that. Maybe, maybe this, this often happens. We begin to lose faith for prayer. And here's the reason why. We hear what Jesus says. But in our, ex, in our experience, as I was saying earlier, we have asked and not received. 
we've we have sought and we've not found. Maybe you've been praying for a youth worker, maybe you've been praying for whatever it might be. Listen, right? That experience of not seeing prayers answered, it's not always because we're sinning. It's not always because we're asking with wrong motives. Maybe you know you've asked with, to the best of your ability with right motives. Still, you've not seen answers to prayer. Still, you know, God doesn't seem to come through. Here's what I want to say to you, right? Every single Christian experiences that. Every single Christian can say the same. I believe the Apostle Paul could have said the same as well. And so here's what I want to say to that, right? Firstly, as an initial thing, don't let that experience rob you of the very real encouragement that Jesus has given, right? Don't let it rob you. He, don't let it nullify the encouragement. Take the encouragement that Jesus has given us here. Everyone today, take this encouragement. He says, do it, do it. Just, just forget about all the unanswered prayers and pray. Here's another objection, though, which is very much connected to that. It's this. But what kind of encouragement is it that says everyone who asks receives, but not everyone that asks receives? What kind of encouragement is it that he says, yeah, ask and you will receive, and then I ask and I don't receive? You know, doesn't that create inertia? Well, you know, Jesus says, doesn't he, speaks in such a kind of unbridled, generous, extravagant way. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek, you will be fine. Not the door will, will be opened. Elsewhere, he says, you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Ask me, uh, you know, believe that you have received and you will receive it. It's like just all positive stuff, right? Loads of it from Jesus. But we mustn't think that because he's, so encouraging us, which he is, that he is saying that he will answer every question and every request when we ask it. Uh, uh, let's just imagine, and uh, the, the problem is this is how we read it. We read it as if Jesus is saying, we just need to ask, we're gonna get, just like that. And, um, uh, and so when it doesn't happen, we think there's something wrong. But these encouragements aren't to be taken in that way. Just imagine that it was like that. Imagine Jesus actually answered in that kind of way. Every time we ask, right, we just ask for something and Jesus answers it. We just seek for something and we find it. We just, you know, imagine, think about it, right? How all of your family will be saved by the end of today. Because if, if this was how Jesus worked, you'd think, okay, let's just have a quick prayer after the meeting. Maybe Phil, you could close in prayer and say, Lord, save all of our family, all of our friends, all of our neighbours, you know, and if, before the day's up. And by this evening, you'll be getting text messages from relatives that weren't saved saying, I've come to know the Lord. If that's how Jesus worked, all your problems would be solved very, very quickly. You know, everyone would just get saved, wouldn't they? Boris Johnson, okay, let's pray for him. Yes, yeah, he'll be saved. And um, when Brighton play Millwall, or whoever, Brighton will win, but so will Millwall, because there'll be Christians. There are Christians that will pray for Millwall. We can pray for them, but, but you know, if, if he answered everything, it would just be chaos and it's not possible. But what about if he answered just, what about those things that we've prayed that are his will? Well, even, you yeah, know, that we believe are his will, that are good. Well, even those things, even those, if God just answered things just like that, it would be chaos. So what did he mean when he said, what does he mean? 
when he says, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will be found. Well, he means it to encourage us, as I've been saying all along. But not only that, Jesus is kind of also saying this, right, in these verses. There are those that ask and seek and knock. And then there are those that don't ask and don't seek and don't knock. The ones that receive, the ones that find, the ones for whom the door is opened is these and not these. It's very simple. Jesus is saying, you know, that the, these groups of people, though it's those that ask who receive. The one who seeks, the, he's the one who finds. This is kind of really basic, obvious stuff when you think about it. He's the one who finds. And so if you are one of those that does not ask, if you are one of those that doesn't bother to pray, you've given up. If you are one of those that leaves it to others to go to the prayer meeting, etc., then don't be one of those people anymore. Don't be among those people. Let none of you, let none of you be among those people. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, look, come on, let's pray. You'll receive it. You will seek, seek and you will find. Not the door will be opened. So this is firstly a great encouragement. Here's the second thing to get from this. And the second and third points are much shorter. Okay. The second thing is this. God only gives truly good things. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone or asks for a fish, will give him a snake? I think this helps explain why we don't get all the answers that we want. Even the things that we believe are genuinely for God, God doesn't answer them. I think the reason why is right here. You see, let's just take verse 10. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. So Jesus say, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake? The answer is none of us. Okay? And we're evil compared to God. And so the point that Jesus is making is that when we ask, we can be sure that God will only give us good things. Now, we could take it to mean that if we ask for a fish, God will give us a fish and not a snake. But I don't think that's really what he's saying here. I think what he, the point that he's making is he will not give us that. He will not give us a serpent. He will, won't give us that which is bad for us. And here's the thing. He knows sometimes the fish that we ask for will be a serpent to us. We think a fish is good for me, but he knows sometimes that which we are convinced and persuaded is best for us, he knows it isn't. And he will not give us a serpent. And so you see, this is a kind of, a corrective thing that, that, that God holds in place for our good. He knows what is good for us. We don't. He knows what will advance his kingdom. We don't always know. We, we can make the mistake um, that William Lane Craig highlights. William Lane Craig said, reminds us often in, in his talks, he'll say, yeah, we're not God's pets. You yeah, know, the planet Earth is not meant to be a vivarian where God gets the temperature just about right for his pets and gets the habitat just lovely for us so that we can be content and happy. God's not, his primary concern for us is not our happiness. And here we come to the crux of this, right? If Jesus is always clear, we're to pray according to his will. We're to pray for his kingdom to come, for his rule and his reign, Right? What does it mean to pray according to his will? Okay, so God is not so concerned about us being happy in getting the things that make us happy when we pray, but he wants us to pray according to his will. What does that mean? 
Well, let me say, I think we can sum it up in three connected things. And this isn't restrictive, okay? I'm not saying there's nothing else, right? But certainly these are major, the, perhaps the most important things. Number one, his will is that we know and love him. That we know and love him more, right? That is his will. Here's another thing it's his will, that we become more like him. And here's another thing that's his will, that we make him known to others. Okay, there's three things. And I think that covers virtually everything that we really need to know when it comes to his will. That we might know Jesus and love him more. That we might be more like him and that we might make him known to others. Now, that is really important when we think about prayer, even in this, this context right here. Because when we know that that's his will, when it says, ask and it will be given you, ask what? For anything? No. That which is according to his will. What's according to his will? That I might know him and love him more. That I might become more like him. That I might make him known. Ask. Seek that from him. Knock on the door of heaven until he grants these things. And he will. He will. Look, look at what Paul says, Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. My dear children, look at what he says. For who I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. How I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I'm perplexed about you. But what he says there, the important thing is this. He says, my dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. This becoming more like Christ, it includes others becoming more like him. Okay, so here Paul is praying not for himself, it is desires that others become more like Jesus as well as himself, right? But the point is clear, isn't it? Paul was in the pains of childbirth. He was going through it. He was straining at the oars, white knuckles for, the, for their Christ-likeness. God's purpose and aim is not so much to make us happy, but to make us more like his son, Jesus. Now, let's notice a pattern that's going to help us, really help us, I think, with this whole idea of prayer. Jesus, he had a mission. He came to glorify and make his father known. Right. We want to know him. Jesus came to make him known. That's one of the reasons he came. Here's another purpose that Jesus came, another mission purpose. He came to pay the price for our sin that we might be redeemed. So he comes to make his father known, but he also comes to do what is necessary for us to be redeemed. What does that mean? For us to be made more like Jesus. That's what it means. Those two things. That was Jesus' mission, and he prayed for that. And here's the pattern, okay? Ultimately, Jesus, I've got a little, little rhyme here for you. Jesus prevailed in his mission. And we can be confident prevailing in our mission. If our mission is to know Jesus, to love him more, to be more like him, to make him known. We will prevail in our mission. Jesus prevailed in his. We will prevail. That's why Jesus says ask, because we will. But, but, Jesus prevailed, but first he travailed. Didn't he? Life was hard. Man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. Jesus travailed through life and prevailed in his mission. I think that means for us, in prayer, 
we travail in prayer. And as we travail in prayer, now that we, we keep at it, we don't give up, we prevail in becoming, in knowing him more, in loving him more, in becoming more like him. And this is no small thing. Look at what Paul says. He talks about, you know, the pains of childbirth. Look at, listen to what he says in Philippians. He says, I, look at this, he says this, I want to know Christ. See, if this is our burning desire, that's what we pray for. Then we're kind of on par with the Apostle Paul. There. I, but he doesn't just say, I want to know Christ. And listen, and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. But think about what he's saying there. I want to know Christ and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. You know, we can only really know Jesus. So we can only really know him in suffering. Without suffering, we can't really know him. We can't really identify with him without suffering because he suffered. A great, great songwriter called Don Francisco. We're coming home now to land. A great songwriter called Don Francisco wrote a song called Too Small a Price. And it's, it's a song written from the perspective of the thief on the cross that turned to the Lord Jesus. And let me just read to you the last verse. It says, then, this is the thief speaking as he's there hanging on the cross then, with all my courage, in a voice not quite my own, I asked him, Lord, remember me when you come into your throne. He answered me. And even then, his love was undisguised. He said, before the sun has set today, you'll be with me in paradise. Well, the shouts and curses did not stop, even when the sunlight ceased. But somehow, in the midst of it, my soul had been released. And though the agony continued, it was still too small a price to be allowed to hear those words and to die beside the Christ. I wonder if you've ever thought of the privilege that that man had to suffer alongside the Lord in faith. We travail in prayer and in humility and in faith. We prevail in knowing Jesus and becoming more like him. All of this is to say that prayer is really about our relationship with God, isn't it? It's not about getting stuff, you know, a vending machine that works. It's about him, about knowing him, being in relationship with him. Here's the deal, right? Yeah, you might think, ah, oh, but I want to see this happen and I want to see that, you know. Listen, the more we know him and the more we love him, the more like him we will be. And the more like him we are, the more effective we will be as witnesses, as evangelists. The more like him we are, the better we will live. Everything will be better. And as we close, as we close, I want to speak lastly to some of you who might feel that, okay, all this is good, but I have blown it. You know, God isn't really going to be interested with me. I'll be a hanger on in the church, but I, don't, I, I can't lift my face to him. 
I'm, I'm too sinful. I've messed up. I've blown it. Maybe you put on a front and no one knows, but in your, you know, you, you feel you've blown it with God and that he's not interested in you coming to him in prayer. Well, think about what Jesus says in this encouragement to us. And you'll see that it's for you as well. If you then, Jesus says, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to you? If you, though you are evil. See, Jesus, when he gave this teaching, he was speaking probably to thousands of people. Thousands of people. And among the crowd that he was speaking to, there were the self-righteous, there were the humble who genuinely sought the Lord, and there were the wicked, you know, crooks and maybe paedophiles and adulterers or whatever, liars, all of them were there. So, but Jesus tars them all with the same brush. He says, though you, you lot, you're evil. Even though you're evil, yeah, you'll give good gifts to your children, he says. But just take that, that thought for a moment. Even though you are all evil, I'm saying to you, Lot, ask and you will receive. Ask to be more like Jesus. If you maybe you're wicked, ask, Lord, may I know you more? May I become more like you? May I make you know? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. Thank you for this great encouragement. Ask, seek, knock. Lord, we thank you that you're not a vending machine and we're sorry that we've ever treated you like that. But Lord, we hear your invitation to ask in your name for your glory. And we know, we're so glad, Lord, that that means us knowing you more. And I pray that you will help this to be a, the focus of our prayers, that we might know you more, that we might love you more, that in all of our service, we might be looking to you, to please you in everything that we do, to be in fellowship with you, and that we might become more like you and make you known to others. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Julian, thank you so much for that very clear and uh, motivating talk that uh, on, on the subject of prayer. And uh, can I also add personal thanks to Julian for his support and counsel um, and fellowship over the last, well, many months, but the last few months in particular. Uh, it's been great to have uh, Julian as a colleague and praying together and seeking to support one another uh, and support one another's churches in these past particularly difficult through few months. Well, we're going to sing. And uh, the song that I chose, which I think at least touches upon the matters that, that Julian mentioned, is number 850, Take My Life. Uh, Let my life be in your hands, Lord, and my hands and my voice and my money and my motives and my love take me and then use me as I pray in your name. So 850, take my life.
So having sung, it remains simply to close the meeting, which I'll do by reading this doxology from the end of um, Jude. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence, without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority, through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and for evermore. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope it's been a good time this morning and uh, see you all soon. God bless. Bye-bye now. <laughs>